Assalamualaikum. My name is Amal Rafiki. I'm one of the attorneys here at uh, CARE San Francisco Bay Area's um, office. We take a whole host of questions regarding, um, especially during COVID-19, regarding unemployment insurance. Employment discrimination has been something that we've been known uh, to speak out for the rights of American Muslims. Um, in today's webinar, we'll touch upon both of those areas. If there are any questions, I'm happy to take them towards the end. So inshallah, please stay tuned. Hopefully it won't take too long in about 20 to 25 minutes, inshallah. So again, what are some of the topics we're gonna to talk about? Like I said, what do you do if your job has been impacted by COVID-19? Obviously it's still a continuing crisis. The pandemic is at its worst ever point now in California with almost um, 3000 deaths nationwide. Um, what do you do if your job is impacted, was impacted in the past? What were your options? It's good to know uh, for the future, um, God forbid, if you're laid off, you've got your work hours cut, um, and if the pandemic continues to have the economic impact it's having. Uh, we will touch briefly about some of the leave laws, and most importantly, we'll talk about general religious accommodations and dealing with discrimination because of your religious identity, your national origin, um, and faith, um, and, and, and we'll talk about that. So let's get into it. Uh, what do you need to know if your uh, job was lost, your hours were cut, um, you, you took a significant uh, cut and you, or you were furloughed? What happens in those situations? Ordinarily, when people lose their jobs through no fault of their own, they can apply for unemployment insurance. Um, you know, unemployment insurance is a program that essentially provides temporary and partial wage replacement for people who are looking for jobs, in between jobs. They're usually you know, payments every week. They're, they're sometimes paid out bi-weekly, but they're payments every week uh, for individuals to help them with their living expenses and other such things. Now, there are some basic requirements for receiving unemployment insurance. Number one, number one thing, people ask me, um, I wanna leave my job, it's a toxic work environment, I don't like the work that I'm doing, can I then apply for unemployment insurance? And unfortunately, um, you know, while I may not support labor laws and laws being that way, currently as it exists, you may not apply for unemployment insurance in that situation. You have to have lost your job or been underemployed, let's say your hours are cut through no fault of your own. Now this is even before COVID. Let's say your boss was to say, you know, I'm sorry, we don't really have um, space for you. Um, we're changing projects. Um, we don't believe this department is useful and you face cuts. That's through no fault of your own. Now, what happens if you're let go because of poor performance, um, other issues, disciplinary issues, then unfortunately you may not apply for unemployment insurance. Now during COVID, what it means is if your place of business, your workplace closed because there was no work, the pandemic affected it, um, and specifically because of, the, uh, because of COVID-19, your hours were cut, that's a situation in which there was no fault of yours, um, and that's when you can apply. That's the first requirement. The other requirement is that you need to have sufficient prior earnings. Now, it's a very legalistic term. What does that mean? Generally, um, what EDD, the Employment Development Department, the Unemployment Insurance Agency in California does, is it goes back 18 months, so and it breaks it down into quarters. Um, and every quarter, essentially, it looks if you've had one quarter in which you've earned at least $1,300. And if you have earned at least $1,300, you're good to go. If you haven't, there's another formula, which is about $925 a week or so. Um, and you need to have earned at least minimum. Why do I say that's the case? Depending on how much you've earned per quarter is how much you get back in unemployment insurance. Think of it this way. Unemployment insurance, as you know, is something that comes out of your paycheck. It is something um, in which you know you are paying into for a rainy day, such as being laid off, that you can then take money. So depending on how much you earn per quarter is how much you'll actually get back as well. The third and final thing, which is a bit tricky, particularly early on during the pandemic and might continue into the next year, was you need to show that you're ready, willing, and able to work. What do those three things mean? They're not just as simple as some random terms. Being ready means that you are actively looking for a job. Um, that's something that you are um, you know, currently in the process. In the past, you'd have to show you've gone to interviews or job fairs, obviously because of COVID it's been harder. In the early parts, EDD waived that requirement, but now they're still going back as they've determined that there's some sort of recovery happening in the economy where you can actually go and apply for jobs. Even if it's online, you don't obviously have to go to a job fair in person or expose yourself to that risk. Um, but that's something that you have to show they are ready. Um, willing means that you're receiving jobs and you're not turning them down simply because you're like, oh no, I want something different. 
Um, you don't have to accept jobs necessarily that are not within your scope. Let's say you're an engineer or a lawyer and you're getting jobs, let's say to work at um, a printing factory. Um, and that's something that's outside your scope. You can you know, make the argument that that's not really you know, replacing your wages in your interest areas, but you can't simply turn down jobs. And you know, unfortunately, if there's a situation in which those are the only jobs that are available, you would have to take those jobs as well. Um, and the other thing about being able to work is a couple of things. You need to have work authorization. Obviously, if you're a citizen or a green card holder, you're good to go. But if you're a visa holder, you need to be having the type of visa that allows you to work in the United States. Um, you know that green card holders sometimes and also spouses of green card holders will get an EAD, an employment authorization document. That is fine in that situation where you are allowed to um, work there. The other thing is you cannot have some sort of a disability or an impediment preventing you from doing work. Let's say you were injured um, and hurt and are unable to do so. Um, then you are not considered to be able to work. In that case, you wouldn't be eligible for UI. You'd be eligible for some state disability benefits, um, workers comp if you were injured on the job. That's a separate area. And for that, you should really be reaching out to either care or others who work on labor law and um, providing and public benefits. But if you are not able to work because of an injury, whether it was on the job, off the job, and you're applying for state disability benefits, you may not be eligible for UI. Now, sometimes if your state disability benefits are not enough um, and you can earn some UI, they combine the two. Again, a bit more complicated, but just so you know, these are things that you should be focused on. What's another thing? Another common question people ask is, how much can I really get from UI? I, I touched upon that briefly. The minimum is about $40 to about $450 a week. Plus, I write this, an additional $600 per week under the CARES Act. We had the CARES Act up until the end of July. It expired. Unfortunately, uh, Congress and Senate did not extend it and were not able to extend it. Um, but it, it, what would happen is, that, let's say if you earned $50 uh, per week, you would get the additional 600. So it'd be 650 per week. You'd get payments in about two weeks. So it would be about 1300 for two weeks. Now there are talks, um, for some of you who have been paying attention in Congress and Senate to allow for $300 a week under unemployment um, insurance benefits um, for people under the CARES Act or another form of an act that would allow people to get those benefits. Obviously, you know, people are still struggling. Um, the additional $600 would be ideal. Uh, there is an opportunity for people to speak to their Congress members and elected officials to see whether they could push for them to actually get those benefits and have those hires. Now, how long can you get that? The quick answer is you can get your benefits as long as you don't run out of them. Um, you know, EDD will often tell you you've got about 15,000 in benefits and you can use them for however long, but the max you usually ordinarily could get is was 26 weeks. Under the new federal laws, what is done, especially till the end of this month, under this year, so only until the end of this year, was you could get 26 weeks plus 13. Um, and Gavin Newsom also introduced laws that add another seven weeks. So that would be up to 46 weeks is how long you could get them. But those 26 plus 13 um, weeks have to be before December. So people who've been getting unemployment insurance benefits from um, let's say the summer or early on um, in the pandemic are probably starting to see that expire at the end of this year. Um, and that's something that's important um, to keep in mind. Now, what are some things that you should be aware of when you apply for UI? You apply, like I said, um, you can apply online at ui.edd.ca.gov. Um, you can apply by phone. Um, or by mail, I think the best and the easiest option, even while the system is clogged, is to do so online. One thing to look for is always answer honestly. So that's like all previous employment, when you were laid off, what your wages were, all that is important, whether you're currently working, because if you provide you know, knowingly or unknowingly false statements, there's a penalty. It doesn't mean you have to pay. There's usually penalty weeks, which means that if you received any benefits, you may have to return them with interest sometimes. And also, you, let's say you're eligible for UI benefits, but you may not get them for the weeks that you're serving the penalty. So it might be like three to four weeks you don't get them. And obviously um, a month's worth of UI benefits and not having them can um, be difficult for people, especially in this um, environment. The other thing to note is once you are approved for UI uh, payments, you have to keep certifying every two weeks that you're still looking for a job, you're ready, willing and able to work, you haven't found another job, that's something you have to show and sign and certify. Obviously, do not lie on that as well. If you find another job, you should be letting them know so the payments stop um, in that front. But that's something that it's important to know. Again, if they later find out that you've been receiving payment from a new employer or um, any other sort of uh, any of that nature, you will 
you know, like I said, be penalized for it and have an interest payment on it. Um, now, what are the things should be should you be focused on when applying for UI? All letters from the EDD. So EDD will often send you a letter once you've applied if you've been approved with a Bank of America card that through which you can then receive your benefits and withdraw money. Um, but all letters from EDD, whether it's to certify, whether it's to provide a clarification, EDD will also often send a letter to your employer. You don't have to respond to that, but just so you know, they'll ask your employer, is it true that this person worked on this from this time to that time they were laid off the reason for the layoff that they listed in the application is actually the reason those are all things um, that they will uh, focus on as well and that is important for you uh, to listen to and learn now if you're denied benefits that's another important thing to focus on you can appeal by sending the notice back um, and you have about 10 days to respond, please get the help of an, uh, of an attorney, um, such as ours and others, um, in responding back to this. Um, and sometimes it's just a matter of saying, hey, my wages weren't all put in there, I made a mistake, um, there were some wages that I had, and we'll talk about that a bit later, um, that's something to do. And like I said, please do reach out to attorneys to for that consultation. Now, another thing to do is, people ask me, can I apply for UI if I was an independent contractor, you know, you've got a 1040 form or others um, during that time, or um, you have your own business. Generally, the answer is no. Um, under California law, uh, generally though, something to note is all workers are considered employees, other proven, uh, unless proven otherwise, obviously a 1040 and, and those sorts of forms uh, vacillate against, uh, sorry, 1099 and other forms vacillate against that. Sometimes what happens is that employees are misclassified. We know this is an issue through um, some of the stuff that's been happening around Uber and Lyft drivers, for example. They've been classified in the past few years as independent contractors. There was a California law 85 that said, no, they are actually employees. We saw a proposition that just got passed um, I would say um, quite detrimentally and unfortunately for gig workers that said that there should be an exemption specifically for people who drive ride shares and they're not employees. But there's a test. If you are not sure if you're an independent contractor or an employee, there's a test that you should know. And the test is called the ABC test. Um, it's in a, it's in a California Supreme Court uh, case. Um, essentially, number one, um, you are an employee um, uh, of the employer and an independent contractor only if um, you know the boss the company that you're working for does not control the work you perform let's think of it as if an accounting company was to hire you um, to do a paint job um, and you owned a painting company right so in that situation the boss would not tell you ordinarily the company wouldn't say oh you need to paint xyz you need to do it this way this is the type of brush you need to apply that's something in which you there's no one controlling you number two you do not perform the core work that the company does. Let's say that, um, you know, like in this situation, they ask you to provide, you know, um, help with electrical. Um, they ask you to provide some consulting on accounting. Let's say it's a tech company. That's not the tech company's main work, right? If you're being hired as um, an accountant to do some work, you, it can be seen that you're a contractor. The boss does not control the work you do. So they're not telling you how to do it. They're just asking you to complete a, a job or a project. Number two is you're not performing the core work of the company. Let's say if you're an accountant who was taken on contract for an accounting company, there's an argument to be made that you're actually an employee because they're controlling how you're performing the work that you're doing as well as um, the core work. Now, the third and final thing is you don't have an independent business doing the work you're performing. Let's say you had your own accounting company or you had a company that worked on repairs um, and you were contracted or you were asked to come in for a company, there's a chance that then you're an independent business contractor or an independent contractor. You know, to use this example um, earlier, if you're hired by, let's say, an accounting company to perform some maintenance on their walls or painting job, you have an independent company, you might be likely, likely deemed to be an independent contractor. But if you don't have those, then you're not. Like I said, um, we generally advise Uber or Lyft drivers to say that they're employees because of the various laws, because of the fact that their work is being controlled. They, they can't just do whatever work they're doing. They're told when to take those rides and how to take those rides. And they're actually performing the core work of the company, which is ride sharing. And they don't have an independent business. Um, you know, people like to think of themselves as entrepreneurs, but necessarily ride sharing isn't um, one of those spaces. Now, if you're ever in doubt, apply for UI. The worst, they will reject your applications, obviously don't lie um, and we can always provide advice. Now, 
let's say you are an independent contractor or you're self-employed. What can you do? Are you out of luck in this situation? No, you can apply for something that's come about because of the pandemic and because of the CARES Act, which is Pandemic Unemployment Assistance or PUA. What is PUA? We'll talk about that in a bit. Now, another question, like I said earlier, is, you know, people say, oh, all my wages weren't reported. This often happens for misclassified workers, such as rideshare, people who are, who are paid by cash um, or by check partly, you know, you may have your wages. You can ask EDD to investigate whether additional wages can be added. So you can, you know, document from your 1099s, your deposit records, or an app in which you're being paid to say, like, let's say Venmo or Zelle or whatever, that you're getting cash from this company for doing the work that you are, and it should be added to your wages. The benefit of adding to your wages is that you will also get more unemployment insurance benefits. Um, I always ask people to collect those records, you know, pay stubs, um, screenshots of those apps, et cetera, to prove to EDD, um, and you can reach out to them directly. Um, you can try them on the phone. They're often very busy, but mostly through online to say, I need to add my, my wages in that situation. Um, and the way to do that online on the website is you go to the, the portal, you select claim questions, um, and then you click on to the missing wages from claims on a drop down menu. And then you add and explain why they don't have it. And you'll say, well, my employer has paid me partly in cash, partly in check, and that's why they don't have it. And then an auditor uh, from EDD will, will check in to, to, to investigate and confirm um, how to do that. Now, let's go back to PUA. Like I mentioned, PUA stands for Pandemic and Employment Assistance. This is for workers who are out of work because of COVID-19, but we're not eligible for UI. What does that mean? If you're eligible for UI because you're an employee, because you paid into it, you have enough wages, you should apply for UI, not PUA. You will not likely get PUA just because you're like, well, I want to choose between one or the other. Anyways, UI is better for you in terms of benefits. But for people who are independent contractors, self-employed, and don't have the option of applying for UI, they can apply for... Uh, PUA, essentially it is there for people who are out of work because of COVID-19. Um, so, you know, and it's also for people who use all their unemployment insurance benefits. Let's say you ran out of the $8,000 that you were due um, and you wanted to apply for PUA. PUA is something that can help you if you run out of it. Again, another thing to remember, it's till the end of this year, um, unless the benefits run out on that sense. Now, the other thing is you also have to continue to be work authorized. So if you're um, undocumented, um, unfortunately, or out of a visa status, you may not be able to apply for either UI or PUA. Um, and again, what under PUA classifies as a COVID-19 related reason, it's things like the place of employment was closed because of COVID-19, you had to take time off to provide care for a child or a household member who can go to school um, or work because of COVID-19 issues. So you had to take care of them and they were dependent on you, including children. Um, you were yourself diagnosed with COVID-19 or had those symptoms and are seeking a diagnosis. You're caring for someone who was diagnosed with COVID-19, your doctor, medical provider, the city, the county, some government officials has asked you to self-quarantine for let's say a couple of weeks or a month um, and or you had to quit because of COVID-19. That's a COVID-19 related reason and that should make you eligible for PUA. Um, just something you know. Now, how much can you receive? Um, and the minimum benefit, unfortunately, is usually half of the state's benefits. It can be up to about $167 to $190 a week, um, if you think about it. Um, they're also calculated very similar to PUA, which is like, let's say you previously get got unemployment insurance um, and now you ran out of your benefits. They look at the calculation to determine how much you got. For self-employed contractors as well, and independent contractors, they'll ask them how much you're receiving in this quarter, how much you were getting paid or how much you earned um, to determine how much you should be getting back. Um, and those are things that are, you know, um, eligible for you as well. And the same thing, um, you know, it's 26 weeks plus the extension of 13 and then the California extension of seven, so about 46 um, as well. The benefits, unfortunately, will run out uh, at the end of this year. As you know, there's a lame duck session in Congress. There are talks trying to extend these PUA benefits. I know mean, people desperately need them, and we're hopeful, inshallah, that they'll pass so people can then continue to uh, make use of it. It's still important to get a sense of um, you know, how to apply for and how much people can apply for in case they're extended. Um, same way to apply for PUA as, as UI is through the website edd.gov. Um, same, they'll ask you to apply for UI, um, you know, um, they're, they start accepting applications starting on April 28th, so we're still in the process. Now, another question that we often sometimes come across is, um, you know, what if I'm still being required to work, but I don't think it's safe? Now, as you know, um, for example, in Santa Clara County and counties in the Bay Area, 
Um, you know, they're moving back in shelter in place order. So there's more reason for people to say, I can no longer show up to work and I need to apply for PUA. You as a worker have a right to refuse unsafe work. You know, this the uh, OSHA or the Occupational Safety Hazards Act in which if there's a dangerous workplace, you can, you can whistle blow and report on that workplace, but you also have a right to be free from an unsafe workplace. You can refuse that work, but it's not just refuse to work and don't show up to work. It's that I'm sorry, I can't work. And then you have to work towards a, a, an acceptable solution. For example, you can demand proper safety equipment, PPE, like masks, gloves, proper sanitation. You can also request that, you know, there may be, there should be accurate and ad, adequate distances between you and your coworkers, between you and employees, other employees, customers, clients, whatever your workplace is. Um, you have a right as usual to organize and ask for better safe conditions, right? Um, some people have asked for like plexiglass. Some people have said only, let's say five people are allowed in the establishment at the same time. Those are all things that are fair to ask uh, before you quit. Um, that's one requirement that you have that I think is really important because unfortunately it's a high bar um, you know, these are things that you should really um, be looking at. Remind, remember, for UI, you can't quit. You need to have either been laid off, but the exception here is unless it was a really dangerous condition. Um, and you need to show that you tried to address and resolve the problem with your employer first. They refused or they didn't provide enough situations. I think as attorneys, we tell people to, you know, ask your employer to improve those conditions. Um, and you feel forced to, and if you feel forced to quit, you should let your employer know you're quitting. I want to be this to be in writing. I'm quitting because I believe that the conditions are not safe and that precautions are not taking. Um, why? Because when you do apply for PUA or UI at that situation, then if they ask the employer and the employer says, well, the person just quit, um, you can make the argument that you know you quit and because you were forced to um, since the conditions were not safe. Um, obviously, if you have a health condition um, or an underlying medical condition that puts you at higher risk, that's sort of like a disability accommodation. So in that situation, they should continue to provide you either an opportunity to work away from home or work hours that put you less at risk. Um, you can apply for, you can always ask for an accommodation for your disability, um, or they can even change your work assignment. Let's say you work in a place that puts you in the front lines to interacting with people, you can ask them to shift away from it um, in that situation as well. And it also applies for people who are over 60, which is considered a more vulnerable uh, segment of our society as well. So that's something that's important to realize as well. Now, what happens if you or a household member gets sick? You can, very briefly, I'll talk about this, apply for paid sick leave and or protected leave if you're still employed. If you get sick, a household member gets sick, use your paid sick leave, especially under California law. Um, unfortunately, the state law allows for paid sick leave to be as less as three days. There are some localities like San Francisco that have been providing emergency funds to employers to provide up to like 40 additional hours. Um, and you know, under new federal laws, um, especially starting in April of this year, um, if your employer has fewer than 500 employees, you have the right uh, to two weeks of additional paid sick days, sick days from your employer, especially if you are dealing with COVID-19 or someone in your family um, is. So another thing um, is that if your employer has 50 or more employees, you can also get up to 12 weeks of leave and job protection, but that's unpaid, um, unfortunately. Um, like I said, with state disability insurance, if you are unable to work because you've got an injury um, that prevents you, let's say a back injury, you would have to get doctor certification to get those benefits uh, as opposed to UI. If you got sick with COVID-19 or others during work, you can get workers comp um, on that situation. And obviously there's also paid family leave, which is if a family member who's considered close, like um, you know, spouses, children, grandparents, uncles, aunts, as long as they're close to take care of them, um, then you can get certification there um, in that sense. Now, quickly to recap, you know, if you are undocumented, out of visa status um, in this country, you're unfortunately not eligible for UI or PUA. Remember, one of the requirements is that you need to be authorized to work in this country to receive any of those benefits. Um, but you are still eligible for paid sick leave, state disability insurance, meaning if you got injured outside the job, um, also workers comp and then paid family leave as well. There was a brief fund for undocumented workers and their families that Governor Newsom passed. It was about $500 um, one-time payment. Unfortunately, the first version of the CARES Act, which allowed, which gave people $1,200 per family, up to $1,200 per family, excluded families that had undocumented workers. So that's something we want to be mindful um, of as well. And I'll briefly pause to see if there are any questions um, that have, um, you know, popped up um, on Facebook as well currently. If you have any questions, please, please leave a comment there. I'll, I'm monitoring that as well before we go into 
uh, questions around uh, whether or not um, they, people have any questions. So I see that there aren't. Um, I'll move on um, really quickly um, and talk about um, um, religious discrimination um, as another topic. So CARE does a lot of work representing people who are um, affected by religious discrimination. Now, one thing to know is the laws that are applicable are Title VII of the Civil Rights Act, which you know prohibits discrimination on the basis of race, color, religion, and national origin. These are important areas of focus. Um, you know, this is a situation in which um, if your employer is discriminating, then that's something that you can use to sue them. The requirement is your employer has more than 15 employees. In California, you have something called FIHA, the Fair Employment and Housing Act. It's also similar to Title VII, but it covers more classes. It also covers like English learner status, sexual orientation, um, gender, and then also it only requires your employer to have five or more employees. Now, what do these civil rights laws require from your employer? They require that they provide you with a reasonable religious accommodation. Remember, you can also get an accommodation for a disability. Uh, we're not gonna focus on that today, but the, the same sorts of elements apply, which is that a reasonable accommodation is one which eliminates your conflict, You know, your need to perform your religious duties and obligations and in the employer's requirement without creating the, the keyword is an undue burden on the employer. Um, the employer is not unfortunately required to provide you exactly what you're asking for. Let's say you're saying, I need a prayer room for myself and other employees, that's not something required, but they are, they, a reasonable accommodation could be they could allow you to pray outside. Um, they could designate some space or say that you could pray in your workspace as well. Those are all things that are okay and, and should be um, good to go. The other thing is, um, it also depends on the nature of your work and the workplace, whether or not they can provide an accommodation. If it's like the type where you cannot be provided one, then unfortunately that may not be deemed um, you know, reasonable. And we'll talk, talk about those things. So how does this usually work when you're applying for these things? So you have to have had a sincere religious belief that conflicts with job duty. Let's say if your job requires you to be clean shaven, and for some reason whatsoever, most jobs should not, um, and it's your religious belief that you need to wear, wear or sport a beard, then you should be able to get that accommodation, unless the employer can show that it causes an undue burden. You have to let, the employer becomes aware of the conflict, means you have to let the employer know that there's a conflict between what you need and require and um, you know, your religious obligation. And the employer needs to have engaged in an interactive process at this time to accommodate the religious beliefs or observances, um, if possible. So they need to make whatever they can. Let's say prayer times, they say, okay, you can take a break at this time. Your lunch break could be moved at this time or during Ramadan, let's say they shift your workload to ensure that you're not lifting as uh, you know, heavy objects. They could assign it to another coworker or you know, allow you to come in earlier or later, just to use Ramadan as an example. They can, unless it significantly causes an undue burden. An undue burden is like, it costs them a lot of money, a lot of modifications. There's no way for them to accommodate, but they're allowed to ask you for more information as to how, what and how you would like um, assistance in this situation. So that's something that I think is, is useful for everyone um, to know in this, in this case. Now, what is described as religious accommodation? It's very broad. It could be um, religious dress, how you want to appear, hijab, a beard, whatever else, kufi, and grooming practices, like I said. That's all covered, as well as other religious practices, such as prayer, fasting, um, you know, uh, taking a day off uh, for Eid, for example. And those are all things that are covered. Under um, federal and California law, there are different standards for what is undue hardship. Um, you know, in federal, it has to be more than minimal. But California, it needs to be significant difficulty or expense. Like, like I said, it's costing a lot of money for your employer to provide you with those accommodations, or um, it's expensive for them to, you know, shift your job duties around. And it really is case by case and depends on the facts. Um, you know, I, I listed some examples of religious accommodations um, in that sense, which is, you know, like I said, asking for prayer times, a bit of a space for you to pray, to take a break so you can coincide with it, to wear a hijab or a kufi or a niqab, let's say, for example, um, to move your work, work times to accommodate with Ramadan and also to be able to take a, a day off uh, for for your um, you know, religious uh, holidays. Um, and requesting one, um, like I said, there's no magic words. It's the, what you need to do essentially is let the employer know of your sincerely held religious belief 
uh, as a practicing person of faith, for example, ask them for that accommodation. But before you do that, it's really important to review the employer handbook as the process for doing it. Some of them might designate a supervisor, an HR manager, um, and it's important to get to them early as soon as possible so they can know of it. Make it clear always that this is because of your sincerely held religious belief. If you do it orally, follow it up with a written email, letter, whatever that is, so you can document it. Always, always, always document these things and then engage them in dialogue. You know, there, there's always some give and take and some compromise that can be satisfactory for all parties, um, you know, in, in this world. And, you know, it's, it's situation may not always be ideal and perfect, but you can move things in a way that allows you to get the religious um, accommodation that you need. And in all cases, um, we're here to tell you that we're here to support and help and, and, and push and negotiate with employers on your behalf if that's needed. Um, so, you know, again, um, just a quick overview um, before I went in there. Um, there are federal laws, like I said, Title VII, Americans with Disability. This is for people um, asking for uh, religious, um, for accommodation based on disabilities, age discrimination, um, and then there are state laws as well. Now, what if you're dealing with harassment at work? Um, you know, harassment is defined under a law as unwelcome conduct that's directed at you, the individual, because of your protected characteristics. What's protected characteristic? Race, national origin, religion, gender, sexual orientation, English learner status, even immigration status in California. If you are this conduct, even if it's jokes that are sent towards you, that is unwelcome conduct as long as it makes you feel unsafe. Um, it, it does not allow you to do that work. Um, that's something that is considered harassment. That's separate from, um, you know, it, it can also take the form of like obviously sexual harassment as well that is directed towards you because of your gender, sexuality, um, or, you know, making unwanted, unwanted and unwelcome advances as well. That's a bit separate from what is considered hostile work environment in which the conduct that's happening, whether it's your coworkers, supervisors, clients, that it, it's become severe and pervasive, that is now abusive. Um, and it affects your ability to perform your job. These could be like one-time incidents, obviously, but a major incident, for example, that something Islamophobic, uh, homophobic, anything of that nature is said, and it, you no longer feel welcome and are able to do your job functions, that's an example of a situation in which uh, your ability to perform the job is impacted. Um, obviously, the more it happens, the stronger the case that there is actual harassment. And some example is inappropriate jokes, like I said, any derogatory comments or slurs, physical harassment, obviously, and verbal threats as well. All of these um, based on the situation that you're at, show that there is a hostile work environment. Now, using this, you can also prove, for example, your religion or these conduct, this type of conduct is preventing you from being promoted or hired or being fired. If this is, you know, there are comments that are made or actions that are made, or you are now, you know, removed from job duties and that you think is motivating your firing, that's something that's important. Um, or lack of promotion. That's something that's important to know might be religious discrimination. Um, so what do we, you know, just to wrap up, advise people, always, always document incidents, dates, times, and witnesses. If there's an incident that happens of harassment, hostile work environment, or, you know, you've asked for a promotion multiple times, or even a few times when the reasoning given does not jive up, but always report and date who was there, what time it happened. And if you can get a witness, that's obviously helpful. Always review Handbook or policy for grievance procedures. Some workplaces have a, um, a hotline, a whistleblower hotline um, to provide those complaints. Some have HR or need you to speak to your supervisor or manager. Um, and always complain. Always document your complaint, um, unless obviously that individual, your supervisor, boss, manager, uh, coworker is um, the person connecting the harassment. In that situation, follow up with a higher authority than that person and always, always follow it up with written complaint and keep copies of correspondence. So in the future, if you come to care or any other attorneys, they can say, hey, this individual reported this. You had a duty to investigate and stop this and put this into action and you did not. That's why it's important. And we always tell people if you're let go um, or if they're saying, you know, by signing this document, you, you are saying that we've done what we can and you release us of all claims in the future in court and otherwise do not do that without seeking legal advice. Oftentimes, um, if you're asked to, you feel coerced to sign those documents. They may not hold up in a court of law, but they obviously make things more difficult when a lawyer is representing you and is trying to get, let's say, a fair settlement or a resolution of the situation. Finally, um, if the situation is pervasive, like I said, it's very hostile for you in the work environment, um, there's unwelcome conduct, and there's a pattern you're noticing happening with others and yourself, 
we always recommend people file with government agencies. CARE can, our attorneys can, including myself, can come and look at your situation and help you file with the Department of Fair Employment and Housing or the federal agency to, to help solve the situation. But again, that's something um, which will only come about if we are able to learn of this. So always reach out to us. Um, I'll pause here really quickly um, to see if there's any questions that have come up um, on Facebook and if people have um, any um, questions to that effect. Um, just give me a brief moment um, to check in. Um, but, you know, like I said, I think generally um, it'll be important to reach out to CARE if you need assistance with unemployment insurance benefits. Um, if there is a situation in which um, you are unable to um, look at, um, get assistance and you're a victim of um, this uh, harassment that I mentioned. Um, I don't see any more questions there. So what I'll do is I'll leave the contact information there. Um, these are some organizations along with CARE California that help on workers' rights, um, advancing you know, anti-discrimination, advancing justice, Asian Law Caucus, we're based in San Francisco, CARE California with our chapters in the San Francisco Bay Area, in Los Angeles, um, the greater Los Angeles area, San Diego, and Sacramento Valley, as well as Central Valley as well. The Center for Workers' Rights, which is based in Sacramento, does great work on un unemployment insurance, expanding benefits, allowing people to actually reach out to the Employment Development Department, the EDD. As you know, there's been a huge backlog and an unprecedented number of people have applied uh, for this in this situation. So I think that's something um, that, um, you know, uh, we are um, looking at as well. So I would, um, you know, reach out to us. Um, since there are no questions, we'll end uh, early today, inshallah. Jazakallah khair for coming in and, um, you know, reaching and, and speaking to us today. Um, again, like I said, if there's any questions, please feel free to reach out. Assalamu alaikum.